Thank you very much. I uh, want to thank all the individuals and institutions slash organizations that were in any way responsible for, for getting me here for this event. It is uh, really good to see such a, a turnout. I will assume uh, from this turnout that one of two things uh, is true. Either number one, there is an incredible amount of interest in the subject of racial inequity, injustice, oppression, privilege, etc. here at Spalding, and a few people have already snickered at that. I can't imagine that you would do that. Uh, or extra credit still counts for something in higher education. <laughs> but it's cool, either way, I really don't care uh, why you came. The fact is you're here now, and uh, even though the lights are a little dim and as the sun goes down they will become more so, I will still be able to see you if you get up to leave. <laughs> and that's rude. And I'm not above calling you out, so uh, it will probably behoove you to just hang out for a little while. Um, now, having said that, I, there is a disclaimer that I, that I need to issue before I begin. Um, and it's one that I issued last night when I was at Syracuse. You know, when you do this for as long as I have been doing it, and by it I mean traveling around the country and speaking about the issues of racism and racial oppression, you get into a bit of a groove after a while where, you know, even though no two speeches are exactly alike. I, I always try to adapt my speech a little bit to the local community or the audience or the school or whatever institution I'm visiting. But you still get into a bit of a groove where each talk is to some extent uh, at least a variation on a theme. But every now and then, um, you know, events sort of overtake your plans and they intervene and they complicate those plans and they complicate the matter of the presentation that you intended to give. Needless to say, um, in those moments, it is important to be able to take advantage of a teachable moment because they don't often come around. And that means perhaps deviating from the script and it means doing some things that are a bit more extemporaneous. And uh, last night was one of these moments. And I assume that I will not be telling anyone news about which they are not already aware. But as I'm sure you know, uh, last evening, the state of Georgia executed a man who they executed despite persistent doubts, and not only on the part of liberals and leftists, people like me, but even on the part of relatively prominent conservatives, a former FBI director, and a group of former death row prison wardens as to his guilt. And I think that in moments like that, we have to be able to step back a little bit and to ask ourselves and to really challenge ourselves to reflect upon what this means. I am not uh, going to rehash the case this evening. This is not going to be a talk about Troy Davis. You can, and I would highly recommend that you do, investigate the details of his case, however much it may now be settled, I suppose because when you do so, it will tell you some things about your culture, maybe some things you don't want to know. But regardless of Troy Davis's guilt or innocence, it really doesn't matter now. All you need to know about Troy Davis is that he is dead. And he is dead for two reasons, at least, that I can think of. One is because of the inherently arbitrary and capricious nature of the justice system. A justice system which in the course of just a month and a half or so can execute him and at the same time result in the freedom for someone like Casey Anthony. And, and I'm not saying that because I think that we ought to have a lynch mob mentality towards her. That's every bit as inappropriate and uncalled for. But it does go to show the arbitrary nature of the justice system. Because the justice system operates not only on the base of certain race and class assumptions, but also the, the geographic location of where a crime is committed, the attitude of the DA at the time of the charging of the crime, who the victim was and who the victim wasn't. Needless to say, if Troy Davis had been accused of killing the homeless man who Officer McPhail was assisting at the time that he was shot, according to the state, by Troy Davis, I doubt very seriously that the state of Georgia and the DA in Savannah would have ever sought a death charge against him. But because he killed a white man who was also a police officer, you see, that became an important victim. That's arbitrary. That is to suggest that capital punishment is not really about the inherent evil of murder and the inherent necessity of obtaining redress for that grievance and obtaining justice. It is about 
these capricious and arbitrary whims of individuals in particular jurisdictions. It is really a crapshoot that we play with people's lives. If you kill a certain type of person, you will not be asked to die. If you kill another type of person, you will be asked to die. If you kill someone in this state, you will not be. In that state, you will be. That has very little to do with some inherent moral system of justice. And in any system that is as arbitrary as that, to believe that it is in any way just to execute people, to obtain for them final judgment and punishment of a completely uh, final and, 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 and total nature, is to, I think, hope against hope that we can somehow thread the needle, you know, between this inherently flawed process and just outcomes, which we all claim to want to have. So regardless of this man's innocence or guilt, we've got to have a deeper conversation that isn't really about that, but is about why it was necessary, I suppose, in our culture that he died. The first reason, as I said, was because of the arbitrary nature of the justice system. There's a second reason, and it's a lot more troubling. He's dead because the culture in which we live is apparently increasingly a culture of revenge, a culture of payback, a culture of increasing indifference, indifference to pain, indifference to injustice. Now that is a very haughty claim on my part. So I feel I probably have to at least explain why I make it. Can't prove it, it's just an analysis and you are free to accept it or reject it. But I do insist that you should hear it. When I say that Troy Davis is dead because we live in a culture of increasing indifference to pain, and people might say, well, that's a little harsh, you know, that's a little overwrought, that's a little hyperbolic. Well, here's why it's not. Among the people who reviewed this man's case last night, Supreme Court, you know, they, they decided around seven, right about the time that I was stepping on the stage at Syracuse. They didn't, they didn't decide it for that reason. They couldn't have cared less about my plans, but... That was the moment of execution. Now, keep in mind, the Supreme Court could have decided to look at the evidence in this case like any time in the last 20 freaking years, right? Right? I mean, they've had time. They could have done it. Forget the last 20 years, like the last 20 days, the last 24 hours. But no, 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 no. They waited until they had brought this man and his family and the family of the murdered officer, for that matter, into the death chamber to witness his execution. They said, oh, wait, we, we, we're done with our dinner. Maybe we should look at this. Right? And maybe a few of the justices really read the information. I doubt very seriously that a couple of them did. Right? I'm pretty confident Justice Scalia did not. And here's why I can say that without fear of contradiction. This is a man among those who reviewed this case last night who is on record at least once saying that there is nothing inherently unconstitutional about the execution of an innocent person. That's his official judicial opinion and his official moral pronouncement that there is nothing unconstitutional in the eyes of the historical jurisprudence of this country that says that there's anything really inherently unconstitutional about doing that. Right? Now, <laughs> that will lead you to conclude one of two things. Either that Antonin Scalia is a blithering idiot who has no moral claim on the seat he holds or, and this is more frightening a possibility, or he's not an idiot, and he's telling you something about your culture, your country, and the Constitution that might be frighteningly true. See, maybe he knows more about it than we do. Maybe when he says that, as immoral and unethical as it may sound, maybe he's right that actually this country hasn't ever said that due process means anything. Like, it's just this vague concept. We can throw it around, we can teach it in school, we can put it in the Constitution, right there in the Bill of Rights, but it's not really given any legs, it's not given any meat, they're just these empty bones, and so what Justice Scalia is saying, we don't mean it, and we never have. Ha, 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 surprise. I'd like to just put it on him and say that it's his flaw, but actually I'm more inclined to believe that he's got it exactly right, given the history of the Supreme Court. This is a Supreme Court which said, you know, not all that long ago that black folks had no rights which men were bound to respect. Those were also the brightest jurists of their time. And what's interesting, that wasn't just their own bias. Like, that was what the Constitution actually said. They actually did know the law. The fact that the law had nothing to do with morality, the fact that the law had nothing to do with justice is sort of beside the point. They were right about what the law said, but that tells you there's something deeply poisonous and rotten about the culture that needs to be changed. And it's not just the individuals who sit on the Supreme Court who sometimes give us these strange, if inadvertent, and totally unintentional insights into the system that they think is just fine. 
See, I'm sure he didn't mean it as a critique. The Constitution doesn't prohibit the execution of innocent people, and Justice Scalia is just fine with that. That doesn't present any moral qualms for him. Right? Because he's all right.